Amen. Philippians, the second chapter, verse number five. And the word of the Lord declares, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made for himself of, of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found fashioned as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Amen. Shout hallelujah for the reading of God's word. You may be seated in the presence of our life-changing king. And so we are continuing our series on the culture of the kingdom. And like I shared with you last time we gathered that we're going to stay on this culture and deal with different aspects. But we're still dealing with honor this morning. Honoring through sonship. Honoring through sonship. The culture of the kingdom, honoring through sonship which means that we need to honor by being a true son, daughter of God. We honor through sonship by embracing sonship. We share with you that the way that we embrace sonship is that first we identify as a son. We're not just a servant. We are servants, but not just a servant. The Bible says that we are friends of God but not just a friend of God, but we are sons. So we have to identify as sons. Number two, it's important that we mature as sons. As many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And the Bible says that he gives us power, the power to become as many as received him. He gave the power to become. And so we talked about becoming and that we need a landing spot to become. And the house of God serves as a landing spot for us to become what we already are in God. So it's important that we mature and that we are maturing and constantly growing in the things of God. In doing so, we honor God. It's also important that we think like a son. Number three, that we think like a son. And we see the word of the Lord that Jesus Christ he was a son of God, the only begotten of the father. And he had this mind. And the Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What was this mind? He being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made for himself no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. So he had a humble mind. He had a humble mind and he had the right thoughts and the right attitude. He had a humble mind, a mind of asserted, a servant, a right attitude. And so God has highly exalted him. And so we don't lift ourselves up. We don't have a mind that thinks more highly than we ought to, but we have a sober mind. And so we're never intoxicated with our own importance. We never think more highly than we ought to. We're to be sober. We are to have the mind of Christ. And so we need to think like Jesus or think like a son. Jesus was our example. He is our ultimate example. And we want to think like Jesus. Let's go to Luke, the 15th chapter. Pastor D, I'm going to have you to read, starting at verse number 11. We're going to start reading there because I believe that it's personified the kind of mind that we need to have in the story of the prodigal son. It's personified here, and I believe it's going to speak to us. Luke, the 15th chapter, verse number 11. A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, mm -hmm. give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. Okay, you see, first of all, we see this son. He says to his father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. Somebody said, not the right attitude. Mm, not the right attitude. Not the right mind. Not the right mind. But the father did. What did he do? 
and, and he divided unto yes. them his living. Okay. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. Mm, took all that his father gave him and wasted it with riotous living. Go ahead. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, mm -hmm. and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, mm -hmm. and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? He got a revelation in the midst of his foolishness. My, my, my. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. You see the, the term father is being used, and it's used repeatedly in this pericope. Go ahead. And am no more worthy to be called thy son. So we see in Luke the 15th chapter, verse number 19, he says, I'm not even worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Mm -hmm. He no longer thought of himself as worthy of being a son. And let me share with you that there will be some times in your life yes, sir. that you will blow it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And you will think that you are no longer worthy to be called a son or daughter of God. Amen. Can the church say amen? amen? But we thank God that your love is greater than ours. Your love. Is greater. God is better than we are. Because in human terms, this is how we think. Yes, but I'm telling you that it's important that you think like a son. Yes, Go ahead, read verse number 19 again. And am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make mm -hmm. me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. Mm -hmm. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Your love is greater than ours because in our mindset, we're not worthy, but we see the father and we got to think about ourselves like God thinks about us. And so we fall into condemnation and we think that we're no longer his, or we now begin to operate below where we're supposed to be and think that we deserve it because of what we have done. Yes, sir. How many have blown it in your life? Yes, sir. How many have ever blown it and God was merciful yes. and gracious towards you, you and you felt kind of bad that God would be so good to you when you've been so wrong to him? And so we have to understand that the father loves us and his love is perfect. Now, God does not condone us running off and living riotous. Right, right. God does not condone us blowing it. Yes, but when we do blow it, we want to know the heart of God. The heart of God and this story, this pericope is showing us the heart of God and showing us how God sees us right. so that we can see ourselves better. Yes. That we need to think about how God thinks about us yes. so that we can think about ourselves a little better. Let's give the Lord a praise. Yes. Go ahead, read verse number 20 again. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. This is the thing. This is the thing. God sees you 
a certain way. It's important that we see ourselves, even when we have sinned against God, we know that forgiveness is available for us. Forgiveness is available for us, and God loves us, and he sees our need beyond our faults. The thing about it, what, what we think about what we have done, but God sees who you are. See, the Bible says if any man be in Christ, he knew you was going to mess up before you messed up. And so because we are in Christ, God sees you as a son because they that are in Christ, they are the sons of God. So we are in Christ. And even though we don't feel worthy, God sees us as worthy because God in the kingdom is not about your worth or what you think you're worth. It's about your birth. It's a not about what you think you're worth. It's about your birth. And I'm talking about the new birth. Yes, and the new birth oh, is God. that you have been born again. Yes. Not of yes. the will of flesh nor of blood, but by the spirit of God. Yes. And that makes you righteous. Yes. So when God looks at you, even though you have sinned, you don't understand it. We don't feel like we deserve it. But God sees you as righteous. And so it's so hard for us to understand that because we see ourselves as sinners. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But he sees you as righteous. It's a beautiful thing. It blows our mind because his love and what he did through Jesus Christ was so out of this world that it literally blows our mind that we can't believe that he loves us like that. And the thing about it, it doesn't make you want to sin more. It makes you want to be better so that you don't frustrate the grace of God. It makes you want to do better. It doesn't make you, it doesn't give you a license to sin. But what it does, it brings you into the loving care of God to where you want to be more like him when you get the revelation. Can the church say amen? Amen. Keep on reading, dog. Let's read verse number 22. But the father said to his servants, Uh bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Look at God. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it Uh and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead Uh and is alive again. Yes. He was lost and is found. Yes. And they began to be merry. Mm -hmm. Now his elder son was in the field. I said, think like a son. Mm -hmm. Somebody say, think like a son. Think like a son. Okay, let's look at the elder son. The elder son. Now, his elder son was in the field. And as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard the music and dancing. And he was like, what meaneth this? Go ahead. Verse 27. And he said unto him, thy brother is come. Uh And thy father hath killed the fatted calf because he hath received him safe and sound. Mm. And he was angry. He was angry. And he what? was angry. He was angry because he was not thinking like a son. He was not thinking like a son, not in terms of how God sees a son. Mm-hmm. He was thinking not like a Jesus. He was thinking like a Judas. <laughs> and so he was angry because when we think like Judas, When we think like Judas, we think this is um, an unrighteous thing. It's, It's when we think like Judas, hear me by the spirit. When we think like Judas, we think it's a waste to pour out love and resources on somebody like this. How do I know? Because y'all remember the woman with the alabaster box. She broke it. And she poured this expensive oil. And when Judas saw what she did, he was angry about what she did. He said she could have sold this oil and given it to the poor. Now, the thing about the scripture says he was not concerned about that. Judas was not concerned about the poor. What he was concerned about was that money because he wanted the whole bag. And so he was thinking about not, no, 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 look at, look at this, look at this, this money being wasted and being poured out on Jesus' feet. That's money that I could have had. And so we see he's thinking like a Judas, how are you going to waste 
all of this. You never did this for me. You never did this kind of thing for me. Because when we think like a Judas, we don't think that people should be in God's favor unless they do all the things that we do. That's thinking religious. But God wants us to think like a son. A son wants everybody to be in God's favor. Wants everybody to be blessed. And when somebody blows it, a true son doesn't look at them with condemnation, but wants them to be restored to the heart of God. So we got to think like a son. When you think like a son, you stop being jealous and angry and envious of other people. You thank God for what he's done for you. And you thank God for everything that he does in the life of other people. That's thinking like a son. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. Verse 29, read verse 29. And he answering said to his father, Lo, Mm -hmm. these many years do I serve thee. I've been good. Mm. Mm -hmm. Neither transgress I at any time. I did everything you said. I've been the best son. Mm. Mm -hmm. And yet thou never gavest me a kid. You never gave me a kid. That I might make merry Uh with my friends. Yes. (laughs) But as soon as this thy son was come. which There's no good (laughs) for nothing. Trifling Negro did this thing and came back after all of that. You going to throw him a party. We don't want to have this elder brother syndrome. Come on, sir. Go ahead. (laughs) Devour thy living with harlots. Thou hast killed him. Killed for him the fatted calf. Uh And he said unto him, Look at what he said to him. Look at what he said because he's not thinking like a son. What did he say? Son, thou art ever with me. And And all all that that I I have have is is thine. Listen here. He's saying you get mad about something that it's not even valid. Everything that you see in front of me, everything to the right, everything to the left, everything that you see, all that I have, he says, it's yours. You could have killed a calf anytime. Could have had a party anytime. All of this is yours, but you're not thinking like a son. And when we don't think like sons, we don't see the hand of God. We don't see the favor of God in the right way. We don't see the blessings of God in the right way. We don't see all that God is doing in our life. We're looking at what God is doing in everybody else's life, but can't see what God is doing in our life. And yes, there is a blessing to obedience, but we leave that to God. We don't attribute now we're supposed to be X, Y, and Z because we have been obedient and look at somebody else and judge them and say they shouldn't be where they are because they haven't been as obedient as I have. Now, I know what I'm talking about. Let's go to Luke, the 18th chapter. Let's go to Luke, the 18th chapter. Somebody say attitude is everything. Attitude is everything. Luke 18 Verse number 10. Darling, if you can read at verse number 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray. Uh The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. Somebody say Pharisee. Pharisee. A publican. A publican. A Pharisee was a religious person in that day. Mm -hmm. A publican is a sinner. Mm -hmm. So we're not found here. Mm -hmm. You're, You're not found here. But look at the attitudes of the two individuals. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men Oh, are. I thank thee that I'm not like these folks as other men. You know, I'm, I'm righteous. I, I'm not an extortioner. I'm not unjust. I've been with my wife only. <laughs> Talk, sir. Talk. I'm not even like this publican. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. I fast twice in the week. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I got my spiritual regimen going on. I give tithes and of I all that the I money, possess. the tithe, the whole tenth. Come on, sir, the whole. <laughs> and the publican standing afar off. Look at this, look at this, look at this. The publican, the man that's a, a sinner, standing afar off, 
Go ahead, darling. Would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house just Who was this man? The publican. Mm -hmm. The publican. God says that he was more right in his attitude than the person that did all of these right things but had the wrong attitude. He was more right. He says this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Mm -hmm. For everyone that exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. What is the attitude of the Son of God? The attitude of the Son of God is that we thank God for his grace and his mercy. We thank God for his grace and his mercy because we know that we're not righteous within ourselves. Even though we do right things, it does not put us above. We got to think like sons. And we think like sons by thinking like Jesus. Looking unto Jesus who is our motto. We live our life as Jesus was. So are we in this world. And so that's how we live our lives. But Jesus, he had a humble mind. He wasn't exalted like this Pharisee was. And like some People in the house of God are today. We need to understand that we are who we are by the grace of God. So we thank God for his grace and for his mercy. Let's give him a praise for that. This is what the word of God says. Do I have a little more time? I hope I'm not boring you at your at your house, in your living room, sitting at that dining room table. Let's go over to Deuteronomy, the 21st chapter. Because we want some kingdom-minded people. Kingdom-minded people. That's our motto. That's our mandate that we are establishing kingdom-minded people. We think like sons. Sons, we have a humble mind. We're not exalted or lifted up or puffed up or pompous. We have a mind that's sober, a sober mind, because we thank God for his grace and his mercy. Let me share with you how God thinks about you a little bit more. Deuteronomy, the 21st chapter, verse 15 through 17. If a man have two, two wives, mm -hmm. one beloved and another hated, and they have borne him children, mm -hmm. both the beloved and the hated, and if the firstborn son be hers that was hated, uh -huh. then it shall be when he maketh his sons to inherit that which he hath, that he may not make the son of the beloved firstborn before the son of the hated, which is indeed the firstborn. Which is indeed the firstborn. Mm -hmm. Now, listen to you. Listen to me. I, 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 I want you to understand this. This is, this is under the Old Testament. So they had two wives, right? Two <laughs> wives. Yeah. And one was beloved and one was hated. Both of them had sons. Mm -hmm. He says, because you beloved the one, that one is not the firstborn. Right. He says, the one that's hated, they have the firstborn. Right. So right. even though you love one and you love her son, you can't give that person the firstborn rights because they are not the firstborn. Yes, sir. God says that certain things are reserved for the firstborn. Right, right. Amen? Amen. I'm going somewhere. What, what, Which, ver, what, what verse was that, 17? That was 16. Read verse 17. But he shall acknowledge the son of the hated for the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he hath. For he is the beginning of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. The right of the firstborn is his. Why do I say that? Because Jesus was God's firstborn. He was God's firstborn. He was the firstborn of the dead. So we understand that God says about Jesus in Matthew, the third chapter, verse number 17. It says, and lo, 
a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So the beloved is a term that's normally used for firstborn. Now, in this case, he was saying that I'm so serious in Deuteronomy about the firstborn, even if it's under the hate, I want you to I want you to treat it like it's a firstborn because it is his right. I'm serious about the firstborn. But when you see beloved, it's normally the firstborn. Y'all understand what I'm saying? So now he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, in Ephesians, the first chapter, the Bible says, let's turn over there. Let's turn it over there. Turn it over there. Ephesians, the first chapter. I want to show it to you. Let's go to right about the third verse around there. Ephesians, the first chapter. Okay, so he's blessed us with all these spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Verse four, verse four. According as he hath chosen us in him uh -huh. before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, uh -huh. to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. God has accepted all of us into the beloved. So we all are accepted because we have been adopted into God's family and made sons, heirs of God, and joint heirs of Christ. God has dealt with this, this firstborn thing from the beginning since of time when he was planning Jesus to come. Jesus comes, he dies, he ascends to be with the Father, we accept him, we ex receive his honor, he was the beloved son of God. We are accepted into the beloved. Yes, yes. Hear me. Yes. Hear me by the spirit. We are accepted into the beloved. Meaning the beloved, if there was six portions, the beloved would get a double portion and the other four portions would go to the other children. Yes, but the beloved would get a double portion. That's why Elijah Ask for a double portion of the spirit because that's for the beloved. That's for the firstborn. So now we have to understand because we are in the spirit of God. We are spiritual sons of God that now God accepts us into the beloved. Now, Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse number 22. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse number 22. Shout glory when you get there. This is what the scripture says. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, uh -huh. unto the city of the living God, yes. the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. Listen here. To the general assembly and the whole church. Listen here. This yes. is the thing. The whole church of the firstborn. So now everybody that's born into the family of God, they are a part of the beloved. They are the church, the whole church of the firstborn, meaning that God doesn't have any respect of any persons. All you have to do is to be in the family of God. And then you are the favorite, beloved of God. And so it means that we all have access to the double portion anointing. No matter who you are, wherever you come from, if you name the name of Jesus, you are accepted into the firstborn church. Beloved of God. And so how does God see you? He sees you like he saw Jesus. How does God see you? He see you like he saw the children in the Old Testament that were the firstborn. They are, were favored. And so you have access to the double portion. But if you don't think like a son, you're always going to be looking at other people, thinking that other people have an advantage, but God hasn't given them an advantage. What you see is them working out their gifts. What you see is them working out their favor. What you see is them working the word of God. And everything that God has for you is for you. All you got to do is you got to work the favor. 
All you got to do is you got to work the word. All you got to do is you got to work the gifts that he's given to you because they don't have an advantage. What they have is the wisdom and the revelation that they have the favor of God. You got to work the favor that's on your life and do your best to be the best version of yourself. Let's give the Lord a praise. Oh, man, I hope y'all hearing me on today. We are all firstborn son. That's why we have sonship, the school of the firstborn. Because you get a double portion and 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 you get a car and you get a car and you get a double portion. Ha! We got to understand that we are sons and we got to think like sons. And if you're not excited about this, it's because you're not open to the revelation of God. You're not open to the revelation of God because this tells you your rights. It tells you your privileges. It tells you that God is ready to do something good for you. It tells you to expect better. It tells you that your blessing is on the way. In fact, your blessing is already here. <laughs> it lets you know that God has something good for you and you can stop having gloom and doom because God takes care of his own. You're the firstborn of God. You're accepted into the beloved. You have the double portion on your life. You have access. You just got to work your stuff. And my stuff ain't your stuff. You just got to work your stuff. Number four, you got to behave like a son. Behave like a son. And I'm going to share this because in the book of Psalms, the first division, it gives us this picture of what a true son of God looks like. All the way in the Old Testament. And we see this picture of this man that behaves like a son. It doesn't give the man a name, but it says the blessed man. That's what it calls it, the blessed man, but it says blessed. We say blessed is the man, but really it is the blessed man. And the blessed man, the Bible says, he walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Nor does he stand in the way of a sinner. Nor does he sit in the seat of the scornful. But it says he delights in the law of the Lord. So it first starts out by painting the picture of what this son of God shouldn't do. What he doesn't do. He doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Walk in the counsel of of the wisdom of the day, the wisdom of the age. He does not walk in that counsel. He listens to godly counsel. So we got to behave like son. We listen to godly counsel. Nor do, does he stand in the way of a sinner or he does not behave himself like a sinner. That's what it means. Nor does he sit in the seat of the scornful, the angry, or the cynical folks. So he moves in a downward progression in the text. The psalmist says he doesn't walk, nor does he stand. Nor does he sit. The blessed man does not walk. See, walking, you got an opportunity to change directions. But he shows the deterioration that if we are not careful, eventually, We'll go from walking to standing in a more fixed state in our beliefs. But he says, not the son of God, not the blessed man, 
But if he's not careful, eventually what he was walking in, he started to stand in. Eventually he sits in that thing. And once a person gets seated in a particular thing, it's not likely that they're going to move. He says, don't be like this person that continue in evil and ungodly manners to where they get to a place to where they're angry and cynical and now they're looking in judgment and they now complaining and judging everything. He says, this is not a son. He says, but this son, he delights in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate both day and night. He spends his time in the word. He doesn't behave like a sinner. He doesn't behave like the scornful. He doesn't behave like the ungodly. But his behavior is based upon his delighting in the law of the Lord. In other words, he gets his cues from the word of God. And so his behavior is based upon the word of God. Are y'all with me? So he delights or he takes pleasure in the law of the Lord. And in that law does he meditate both day and night. Now the scripture says in Joshua, I believe it says in Joshua, it says, Let not this book of the law depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate on it both day and night. He says, You should observe to do according to all that is written therein. In other words, it's going to reflect in your behavior if you're meditating on the word of God. He says, he says, he says, if you do this, then you shall make your way prosperous and then you shall have good success. If you're delighting in the law of the Lord. So to behave as a son is to delight in the law of the Lord. There is no way for you to live godly without the word of God because the word of God gives us how to live godly. And so when we get that in our spirit through meditation and internalization, we get that thing in our spirit. It begins to show in our behavior. But if you ain't getting no word in you, your behavior is not going to change. Your behavior is not going to adjust. You're going to be just like you were 10 years ago. You're going to be older, but you're going to say have the same nasty attitude, the same ways, the same posture, the same disposition. Because the word, what it does, it comes in and it transforms you. It metamorphs you into a better version of yourself. You become more like God wants you to be as you allow the word to work in your life. And so there should be a progression in your life by listening and receiving and internalizing the word of God to where it gets all up in your behavior. And this is what the Bible says. When you delight in the law of the Lord, you're going to be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Bringing forth your fruit, listen here, in your season. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. When you bring forth your fruit, it's going to be in the right season. Right. It's going to be at the right time. Right. And we can trust the process of God. And the problem with a lot of people in the kingdom of God today, they want it right now. They don't trust the process of God. They feel like they have to jump ahead of the line. They feel like they have to hobnob and brown nose and politic and do this, that, and the other. But I'm telling you that when you delight in the law of the Lord, God would allow it to be so that you're at the right place at the right time, doing the right thing, fulfilling your assignment in the right season, and you will be a fruitful son. And this is what he promises, that your leaf will not wither. In other words, God is saying, not only are you going to be hot today, but you're going to be hot tomorrow. And you're going to be hot in the next 
season and the next season of your life. And when it comes time for you to produce, you're going to produce in that season. And you don't have to worry about what anybody else is doing because you will know that when it's your time, it's your time. And whatsoever you do it. Whatsoever, and that's what it is. When you get into a place when you're sure to show enough bless, Elder Key, that sometimes you ain't even trying to really do something. But because you're so blessed that whatsoever you do it, you're like, I didn't even expect that to come from that, but whatsoever you do it. I put this away in this and now I got more than I expected from this. And whatsoever you do it, I touch this business, I touch this thing, I start doing this thing. Whatsoever you do it, he says, that's going to prosper. Why? Because you delighted in my law. And as a result, you're a fruitful son. And you'll find that you'll start behaving more and more like a son because you realize the blessing that's attached to being a true son. Father, we thank you.